and welcome to the Knitting with Cat Hair podcast. My name is Nikki. I'm also known as Knitting with Cat Hair on Instagram and Cat Hair Knitting on Ravelry. I am coming to you from Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, which lies atop the Tigamishing Anishinaabek people's lands, where I live with my fiance, our two daughters, and our five cats. And if this is your first time here, a big warm welcome and a big welcome back to all returning viewers. I hope everyone is doing well. It's been about three weeks since my last podcast and I feel like I have lots to talk about today. Um, yeah, and I hope, yeah, I hope everyone has been getting lots of making done and enjoying the weather wherever you are in the Northern Hemisphere, if you're enjoying some summer weather and in the uh, Southern Hemisphere, if you're getting ready for winter. So, uh, let's just jump right into things. Firstly, start with what I'm wearing. Today I am wearing my, what I call my summer version of the Ranunculus. Uh, the Ranunculus is a pattern by Midori Hirose. It's a super popular pattern. I'm sure that you've probably heard of it before. It is um, super versatile and really a great knit. Like it, there is a reason why it's so popular. Um, I've knit two to date. Um, one was, um, I was calling my spring ranunculus, which I ended up gifting to my mom and it looks fabulous on her. And I still intend to make two more for fall and winter. I'd like to have um, a made one for each season. They're super quick to knit up and um, they're very interesting. They have this this uh, lace detail and there's some textured stitches and yeah, they're just, it's, it's a really great pattern. I really highly recommend it. I wear this one all the time in the summer. It's super light. I made it out of Ilamani Sabri, which is a combination of cotton and alpaca. At a loose gauge, obviously, and I'm just wearing it over top of my, my gold dress today. Okay, so that is what I'm wearing. So let's move into finished objects. I actually have two today. So first off, I finally <laughs> finished my two at a time vanilla socks. So these don't have a, a pattern or anything. I just kind of winged it. And this time around, I did a few different things that I haven't tried before. So I did some contrast color on the cuff, just a few rounds. So I have notes here and I'm just gonna look down at them to make sure I know what I'm talking about. Um, so how many rounds did I do? I think it was two, yes. Two rounds of the contrast colors. I cast on 64 stitches on US 1's 2.25 millimeter needles. I did these, like I said, two at a time magic loop. And then I knit about five rounds of one by one rib in the main color. Sorry, sorry for the, the background noise. Obviously I'm filming outside and our, our neighbor's baby is making some noise, but she's adorable. Anyways, um, yeah, so so about seven rounds for the cuff. And then I did a three by one rib. And then my standard slip stitch, heel flap and gusset in the contrast color. And then a contrasting toe uh, with a kitchener stitch bind off. So the yarns that I used for this, for these socks are both by Urso Yarn Co, which is a Canadian yarn dyer based out of the province of Quebec. And the yarns I used were um, this main color is the colorway latte and the base is called their Petite Face Bleu, which is in 80% blue face Lester, 20% nylon, non superwash. And then this one is their Mouton base, which is an 80% Dorset, 20% nylon, also non superwash. And the colorway for this one is called Lycorn, which means unicorn in French. I just think they're really cute. Yeah, I don't know why they took me so long. I looked at my notes. I think I started this, I didn't write it down, April something. It took me like two months to, <laughs> to knit a pair of fingering weight socks and you can see they're not very tall. <laughs> so really no excuses. I think I was just distracted with other projects, but very happy to have these off my needles and ready for winter. Okay, next up, I'm calling this finished 
technically I know it's not 100% finished, but um, you can see behind me, I have my chestnut cardigan. So this is a pattern by Marie Wallen. Long-term viewers will know that I started this project 11 months ago, August 1st of last year. And I'm finally done. So caveat, I have not woven in all of the ends. There's still a few left to do. And I've placed an order for buttons, so I haven't received them yet. So when I do, there'll be more pictures to follow. <laughs> I'll take some good pictures of me wearing it. But um, yeah, I'm so, so happy with it. So this pattern is out of Marie Wallen's, um, I can't remember the book. I don't have the book. I actually purchased the individual pattern. Anyways, um, yeah, so here it is. Maybe I'll, I'll, um, I'll put it on so I can talk about it a little more in detail. So it fits, I have to say it fits perfectly. Of course, I don't have the buttons on it yet, but I can see that they're gonna, that they will do up. Although I'm not sure that I will actually do them up. So there we go. Oh, I love it so much. <laughs> I can't wait to wear it in on. Okay, it's super hot out here too right now. So I don't know how long I can keep this on for, but just so I can talk about it a little more in detail. So there's a few things I wanted to say about it. So firstly, starting from the beginning, the pattern is knit in pieces, bottom up, and then seamed afterwards. <laughs> um, and I did follow the pattern. I did exactly what it told me to do. I'm just gonna move a bit closer. And it was an experience. I'm glad that I did it. I have determined that I really don't enjoy seeming color work. I love doing the mattress stitch. However, <laughs> with color work, I find it um, very messy, if that's the term I'm looking for. Anyways, it's, it's not as straightforward as when you're doing it on straight stockinette that's just one color. Um, so that was an experience in and of itself. So you, like I said, you knit it in pieces. So you do the back panel first, bottom up, you start with the corrugated ribbing, can show you this what the corrugated ribbing looks like it's got a bunch of colors in it it's so pretty it's the first time I've ever done this you knit the back panel then you knit each front panel separately so you do a left panel sorry this is my right my right panel and a left panel and then you knit the sleeves flat individually so I knit mine two at a time which I found was very I don't know, it worked really well for me because you're doing some increasing and you have to follow pattern and stuff like that. And I found it, it much easier for myself to do them both at the same time because I knew whatever I was doing on the one sleeve, I would be doing on the second sleeve. So it just took away some of the brain work. Um, and they were knit flat, so it wasn't, it wasn't super complicated or anything. So I just used a really long uh, red lace chowgu needle and did them, did them that way. Okay, so um, afterwards, so after you've knit all of the pieces, I then uh, wash and blocked them all um, just because I like, firstly, it was driving me crazy that they were rolling so much. So I wanted them to stop doing that. So I did, I did wash and block them. And then um, I did weave in some ends, but like I mentioned, I haven't woven in all of the ends yet, but that's fine. And then I, what did I do? Oh, you seam the shoulders first. So you seam the back piece to the two front pieces with, um, I just used mattress stitch on the seams. I used mattress stitch for all of my seaming. And then the pattern does have you, she suggests knitting up the side seams, knitting up, um, sorry, seaming the, um, the sleeves closed and then joining to the body. So I didn't do, I didn't do things that way. I found that, I don't know, it just seemed like it was going to be a lot more complicated. So what I did do was I followed a video tutorial by Very Pink Knits. I will put a link down below to the one that I followed. It was, it's about setting in seaming, set in sleeves or something like that. 
And I just found that made a lot more sense to me and I felt like it was gonna be less um, frumpy, I don't know, bulky. I just thought it would be neater. That's why I did it that way. I don't know if, it's, if it is. I've never, this is my first time doing set-in sleeves, so I don't know if Marie's method is actually better or not. It just seemed more complicated to me. So basically what you do is you lay out your body flat, right side up. So just spread it out flat with the same shoulders. And then you take your flat arms, sleeves, and right side up and place them in the little, I guess, the armholes. And, um, and then you just start, I just use those inter, uh, what do you call, locking stitch markers to clip, firstly, the seam. So I found the middle of the sleeve, I put a clip there to make sure that my sleeves were gonna be centered. And then you do the two ends where, the, you, where you can clearly see where the armholes are starting. And um, yeah, and then just kept interlocking, clipping all the way around. And then I seamed it with mattress stitch. Uh, it's not perfect. And I have not steam blocked this, although the pieces have been blocked individually. After I put them together, I just didn't get a chance to steam block it yet. So it might look even better afterwards. My goodness, it's so loud out here. I am so sorry. I should have known better. It's a beautiful day and everyone's out. <sighs> but I hate filming in the basement. <laughs> Anyways, please bear with me. I hope, I hope it's not too bad. Um, yeah, so that's how I put my sleeves in, my satin sleeves. Um, in terms of the sleeves, the way that I determined how long I would like to make them, um, which I think Marie has a specific line of patterning that she tells you to start the sleeves on, which is interesting because um, I mean, obviously people's arm lengths are different and where I ended off my, my, um, my panels, so to start the armhole shaping will be different from someone who's, let's say a smaller size. So I don't see how you can just say you have to start at this pattern row and it's going to just turn out. Okay. I didn't trust it. And I'm glad I didn't because my sleeves would have been way too long. So what I did was um, I firstly, I measured my arm. So from my wrist where I wanted my cuffs to hit. So from my wrist, right under my arm. So I measured here up into my armpit. And that was, I think, 18.5 inches, which I happened to align with the schematic in the, in the uh, pattern, which worked out well. So then I took my blocked back piece so the full length of the back piece. And I measured from the armhole down. So starting of the armhole down, how long that was. And that gave me 16 and a half inches. So I knew that I was going to have to add in an extra two inches of patterning in order to get the sleeve length that I wanted in order to line up all of my patterns. So I just um, literally took my back piece and measured out two inches, how much uh, how much further that would be in the pattern repeat and where I needed to start. So for me, that ended up being, I had to start on row 40, I think. I don't know if I wrote that down. I'm pretty sure it was row 40. Anyway, all the notes that I, I mentioned here too, probably better explained in on my Ravelry page. I'm not the greatest at articulating things. This is why I'm not a teacher. <laughs> Anyways, so that is how I measured my sleeve length, where I started my patterning after the ribbing. Hopefully that makes sense. So see, you can see I'm kind of halfway in between this pattern here. Actually, not even halfway. I started at the top. I think she had you start at the bottom. So I would have had that much extra. Too long. The sleeves are perfect to me. They're, I mean, they could have even been a little tiny bit shorter, but actually, I don't know. They're not so bad. And you can see here, sorry, I have to point this out. My seaming on the corrugated ribbing did not work out. I don't know what I did wrong there. It happened on the all of the corrugated ribbing. I didn't seem to be able to match it up properly when I was doing my mattress stitch. But whatever. <laughs> it just makes it unique, right? <laughs> okay, so what else did I want to say? I already talked about the seaming. I talked about my arm length, my gauge. My gauge I thought was on. 
Uh, it turned out to be actually after I washed and blocked my whole back piece and, and measured my gauge, I was actually tighter which was okay. I think I was 30 stitches, 30 stitches per four inches and the called for pattern I think is 29. So I was off by about a stitch. So it's a little bit smaller, but it's still, like I said, still fits and I can totally do it up. So it's fine. Just waiting for the buttons to arrive. I've, I've ordered two different buttons, one set of wood ones and one set of, uh, brass ones and I'm going to see which one I like better. I'm already leaning I think towards the wood ones just because I don't know I like wood and we'll see though when I get them. You can never tell over you know computer screen if if they're going to look exactly how you think they are. So um, yeah and I will link the shop down below to where I got these buttons. It was recommended to me by a lovely uh, viewer and friend on Instagram and it is a Toronto-based Etsy shop of, they just sell vintage buttons, which was perfect because, yeah, they should get here pretty quickly and uh, I love supporting local businesses. So that's great. Okay, and so in terms of the specifics, I used a US 3, 3.25 millimeter needle for all of my ribbing and a US 4, 3.5 millimeter needle for the rest. So for all of the color work. And I knit the size extra large, which accommodates a 44 to 46 inch bust. I've mentioned this before. I have a 45 inch bust. So it seems to have worked out perfectly. Okay, now I'm gonna take this off because I'm actually really hot. <laughs> you can see all the ends I haven't woven in. <laughs> <sighs> but yes, I'm very, very pleased. And um, I should say that I knit this up for our make along that we are hosting over on Instagram. There is one month left in this current um, period. It started August 1st of last year. It ends August 1st of this year. And um, yeah, all you have to do is make a Marie Wallen pattern and post pictures with the hashtag a year of Marie Wallen Cal over on Instagram. And as I mentioned in my previous podcast episode, we will be extending that for another year. Um, there'll be a new hashtag. I will talk about that when it gets closer to August 1st. And, and yeah, I hope to see so many other new projects coming out of this. Yeah, it's been really fun, really, really fun. And um, interacting with um, so many of the participants and and bouncing ideas off each other, learning so much. And um, yeah, it's just, it's been such a great experience. And I, I highly recommend you, you give it a go. I know every time I post um, a video, there's always somebody who says, oh, you're so brave. I wish I could, I could do that or uh, oh, I, I don't have the confidence to try a Murray Wallen. And I just, I just want to say they're really not that hard. They're, they look complicated because there's lots of colors overall in them. But for instance, the chestnut only ever has two colors per row. So if you can do that, if you can do two colors, you can do this. And there's very few catching of floats on that pattern. Um, you know, there's people who are much more knowledgeable than me and were able to convert it to knitting it in the round and then sticking it afterwards. And um, so that's always an option if you don't like to purl color work flat. I personally don't mind purling color work flat. I will say like, <laughs> like I mentioned, I'm not a huge fan of mattress stitching color work. Um, although on the plus side, you can kind of, it's, it's kind of easy to line your your pieces up because you just go by the, the actual colors and the stripes that are in it. So that's a bonus. But yeah, not my favorite thing to do. Um, but don't let that de deter you. I mean, you may love it. I we all have our own preferences. But I just want to say that you know don't don't be scared. It's only knitting. <laughs> What's the worst that can happen is you end up having to rip back and repurpose the yarn for something else if you really hate it that much. So, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's a lost cause and you might learn something along the way. There's, there's a lot of skills that can be developed in, in knitting a pattern like this, so. 
And she also has, I just want to say Marie Wallen has lots of free patterns over on, on Ravelry. And she also has non-garment patterns. So she has like uh, scarves and cowls and mittens and hats. And so you, if, you're, if you're worried about it and you're, you're hesitant to start with a big project, try something little first and see if you enjoy it. Um, yeah. Anyways, also, I am not sponsored by anybody. I'm just, I just talk about what I love. So, okay. I think I have talked about the chestnut enough. If you have any questions at all, um, please do not hesitate to leave a comment down below and I will, I will answer them. Okay. So moving on, we'll go into works in progress. Maybe I, since we're already talking about Marie Wallen, maybe I'll move on to um, my <laughs> next Marie Wallen work in progress. So as I mentioned previously, I had ordered a kit from Camilla Valley Farms here in Canada um, for the Samfrey, which is a pattern by Marie Wallen that is found in her uh, Shetland book. I bring it? I did bring it. This book. This book, I want to knit. I've said this before, I want to knit like everything in it. It's so beautiful. So many beautiful patterns. Okay, so let's see if I can show you a picture of Samfrey. Actually, maybe I'll just, I'll pop in a picture. It's just easier and it's bigger and you can see it better. So it is a, it is a pullover that is Again, knit flat in pieces and then seamed. Um, it's all over color work. And actually, I should say firstly that before deciding how I want to proceed with this project, I did watch Andrea of Fruity Knitting's video. So she knit this, um, this sweater quite a while ago. I can't remember which episodes. I'll put a link down below so you can, if you're curious or if you're interested and you want to knit the Samfrey, if you want to learn more about how she did it, um, she converted it to in the round fully with steaking. So I have decided that instead of steaking, I'm not afraid of steaking. I've steaked before. I've steaked a shawl. Uh, I have not steaked a sweater. I just, I'm not sure I'm 100% confident in my ability to shape the neckline appropriately afterwards. Um, I saw that was kind of, I just don't feel like I have the know-how to do it. That's, that's straight up. So what my plan is, is to knit in the round up until the, the creation of the armholes starts. And then I'll convert to knitting flat back and forth. So I'll do the back and the front separately flat and do the shaping as per the pattern, do all of that stuff as per the pattern. And I feel like that's a good compromise for me. So most or half of it will be knit round in the round. And so there'll be less seaming. I'm still debating on the sleeves, how I'm going to tackle those. I think I might knit them um, in the round as well. And then attach them because I think they're drop shoulder. I'm pretty sure they're drop shoulder, they're not set in. So I feel like that would, yeah, that will work. Okay, so I went ahead and um, now that I knew kind of my plan, how I was gonna proceed with things, I went ahead and did some swatches. So because I'm going to be knitting in the round and also flat, I had to do two swatches um, to see it, how my gauge changes. I've never looked at that before. And, there, and obviously because there's never been a reason for me to look at it before, but I needed to know whether or not my gauge actually, my stitch gauge and row gauge actually changes depending on which method I'm using to knit. So as it turns out, um, well, firstly, I'll show you my swatches. So this is knit in the flat. Oh, just look at those colors. I should say there's 14, 14 different colors in this pattern. And they are just bringing me such, such joy. I love them so much. <laughs> okay, so that was knit flat. And this one 
this knit in the round. Equally beautiful. And both of these um, swatches will be used in, like both of these patterns are used in the actual sweater. So they kind of alternate. And there's another band in between them that I, I didn't end up bothering to do, but I've used every single color in both of these swatches. So now I know how it's going to look and I am in love with it. Um, so firstly, I'll just show you the way that I ended up knitting my swatch in the round. At first I had started off by doing magic loop and then um, I pulled a few makers on Instagram and asked them if that might make a difference in the overall, like when I get to actually knitting the body, which will not be knit magic loop. And um, yeah, there were some people who said that their gauge actually changes with magic loop. So I just was like, okay, I better, I better not do it that way then. Cause it's not, I want something that's gonna give me an accurate representation of what my body um, gauge will look like. So instead I did the whole, um, it's a pain in the butt and I didn't cut my strings, but basically what you do is you You knit across and Then you have to do this on um, you, you have to do it on like double pointed needles or something that has two ends on it So like a, a red lace like a chagu with tips at each end and then you slide all your stitches back and you start the next row but when you start the next row you just carry your yarn over and then start knitting with it. So you're always knitting, you're never purling, and you're just, after each row, you just slide your stitches down, start the next row, but you're always leaving a nice long um, piece of yarn behind. So it simulates knitting in the round. So firstly, I know my swatches are ginormous, <laughs> and that's okay, because I always take my swatches apart, and if I, these are so pretty, I would love to just keep them if I could, but if I do need the yarn, I will I will rip them apart, no problem, and use the yarn so that it's not gone to waste, and that's why I didn't cut my ends. Also, um, I, did, I did cut them here. However, I know that I can split splice, should I need to. Okay, so the interesting thing that I learned about my own gauge, and again, th this is just for me, it differs between Everybody's gauge is different. So please do not take this to mean that, you know, it's the same for you. But for myself, when I knit flat or in the round, my gauge did not change. My stitch gauge did not change at all. Um, so I still got 25.5 stitches per four inches on US 4 3.5 millimeter needles. Um, my row gauge, however, did change. So. I guess when I purl, my stitches are looser. So that may, meant that my row gauge overall was looser on the flat knitting, which was interesting to me. It wasn't a huge difference. I think it was only one row. So it's been very interesting for me to find out, to learn more about how I knit um, and the results that I produce because I'd never explored this before. So it was very interesting. Anyways, um, so obviously, no, not obviously, because you wouldn't know, but the stitch gauge for the actual pattern, I think it's 29, 29 stitches, 31 rows. So <laughs> it's going to be hard to get the row gauge. Um, and so I was getting 25.5 stitches. I need 29. So clearly I'm knitting too loosely. I'm going to have to go down a needle size at least. I might go down too. <laughs> this is where it gets tricky. I know I'm not going to be able to get right on gauge and I'm anxious to start. So I probably will wing it and just go down a needle size. Okay. So regardless of whether I, regardless, I will be going down um, one or two. So the other thing when I um, watched the fruity nitty knitting videos and Andrea's um, mention of her experience knitting the Sam Free, and I read through some of the notes on Ravelry, there seems to be a common issue or distaste for the fact that you knit this large panel of ribbing and then afterwards um, you start the color work and that creates kind of like they call it a blousing, like where it kind of bulges out and gives you like this excess amount of fabric at the like right after the after the ribbing. So to fix that, I know Andrea removed 10 centimeters of stitches 
Um, so that is an option. I could remove the stitches and then she just uh, increased all the way up to the, to the armholes. Um, I don't know if she, she must have calculated how many stitches to increase so that it was an evenly, evenly increased. My other option that I was thinking of doing that someone else actually did, I noted in their Ravelry notes, is changing the needle sizes. So going down again, <laughs> of course at this point I'm going to be down to, I'm going to be down to, a US one, depending on what needle <laughs> needle I start with, I might be down to a US one, um, and then gradually increase. Sorry, a US one is a two point two five millimeter needles. Someone asked me to or question <laughs> questioned why I wasn't using the Canadian terms um, on my needle needle sizes, and just so you all know, it's because I. When I started knitting, I just got familiarized with the U.S. number system, um, and just that's just the one that I'm most familiar with. But I will do my best to try and mention both. And okay, so a U.S. one, then I would increase to a U.S. two, which is a 2.75 millimeter needle, and then finally back up to the U.S. three which is a 3.25 millimeter, so throughout the body. So I guess dividing it in thirds up to the armhole. Does that make sense? And then knit the rest of the body a US-3. So that should pr provide, without having to mess around with the actual pattern itself, um, it should hopefully provide a gentle increasing that won't be super noticeable. I hope. <laughs> we'll see <laughs> oh but I'm knitting in the round so it's not so bad so that is my plan for the same free and I should mention did I mention the yarn probably not <laughs> it's knit out of um the original called for yarns which are Jameson's of uh, Jameson's Shetland Spindrift like I said, which I ordered from Camilla Valley Farms. They carry the whole line of Spindrift, as well as other Jameson's yarns. I don't know them all, sorry. I've only, this is my first time working with it. I have to say it's very lovely. The colors are so beautiful. I didn't bring the yarns out with me, um, so there's just, there's just so many of them to show you, but they're very heathered. I don't know if you can, can see that. But I just love, I love, love, love them. I also love this pattern, I think, because of the subtle, the subtlety of the colors and the way that Marie blends them. It's not uh, super, you know, sometimes we're told that color work needs to be very high contrast. And I think this is a case of where uh, low contrast looks really, really lovely. I'm very, I was very much drawn to this pattern. And seeing it in person, like the colors now in person, really made me fall in love with it. So I am so excited to get started on that one. Okay, so that is one work in progress. Um, I did do some work on my daffodil, but not enough to really, to show off. I really focused on getting my chestnut done. So, um, I, I might show that next time if I get some more progress on it. And my bursay dress, same thing. I did a little bit, but not enough to, to show off. So I'm pulling out uh, a crochet project that I haven't shown for a little bit. I am now almost, oh no, I think I'm like 60% done. I'm over halfway through with my hexi blanket. Oh, I can't even show it all, it's so big. <laughs> it's nine hexagons across and I'm gonna do nine vertical as well. So yeah, I am. I love this project. It's it's really great. I It's not really a pattern. There is a tutorial on Ravelry that actually links to a blog by Attic24. Um, she shows you how to make the hexagon squares and squares, the hexes. <laughs> and how to join as you go, which is what I've been doing. And I've tried to weave in a bunch of ends as well as I'm doing it, so yeah, very much enjoying it. 
I don't know if you can tell, it's, it's a series of nine different colors. Um, most of them are Knit Picks Simply Wool Worsted, which is 100% wool in natural shades, so undyed. Um, so I think I have, I have three kind of gray browns, three browns, and then um, there's a few cream colors, which I'm considering the same color because you can really not, it's really hard to tell the difference between them. So I'm just treating them as the same color. And then I've also put in some patents. Um, what's it called? Patents. Classic wool worsted in uh, a dark brown called chestnut, I think, or acorn. One of the two. <laughs> and another color called natural mix, which is this like gray beigey brown, which is really pretty too. So, like I said, I have nine different um, nine different colors. No colors are repeating per row or in the vicinity of each other. I'm trying to keep it really spread out. So it takes a little bit of brain work. Um, <laughs> I explained my method back in another episode when I first showed this blanket I, and I likened it to like a sud Sudoku, Sudo Sudoku, you know what I'm talking about. Those puzzles where you have to put the numbers in the squares and no numbers can repeat, blah, blah, blah. That's basically what I'm doing for this. <laughs> because that's how I roll on my scrappy projects. It's not even a scrappy project. <laughs> These are full skins I'm using. They're not scraps at all. It's just, I didn't know what to do with um, these gorgeous one skein, single skeins of naturally, natural uh, yarn. So this seems to be the perfect, perfect um, place for them. And I'm really liking how it's turning out. It looks really pretty to me. Yeah. Uh, what else can I say about that? I'm using a size H crochet hook, which is five millimeters. And to do, oh, and I'm making this as part of Miga's from the Skeins of Dreams uh, make along, which is the Blankets of Dreams Mal. And you're free to join in. Um, I think it's a year long. Actually, I can't remember. I think it's a year long and we're only a few months in um, so far, I think. So there's still plenty of time if you're working on a blanket or a shlanket or a large project of some sort. Um, yeah, you can check out her podcast for more details and follow along with the hashtag. So I think, yeah, I think that's it for all of the making chat for today. Oh, I haven't even taken a sip of my tea. I'm going to stop here and take a sip. Excuse me. Mm. Today I'm drinking a Twinings raspberry pomegranate tea. On hot days, I like to drink uh, fruity teas. <laughs> so yeah. Um, all right. I guess we'll move into the, oh, I have to, I have to talk about all the comments I received last episode. So last episode, I posed the question, are you a process or product knitter? And I was curious to see if there was any links between a monogamous knitter and, and product versus process. So thank you so much for all of the comments that I received. Um, it's, it's so great. I know this is totally informal. It's non-scientific <laughs> research being conducted here, but I find it so interesting. So it turns out that yes, the majority of, pr uh, product knitters are monogamous or in some variation of monogamy. So yeah, I thought that was so interesting. And then people who enjoy the process are more likely to be non-monogamous. So casting on all the different things. So yes, I found that so interesting. And as I explained um, last time, I myself am a non-monogamous knitter and I very much love the process. Although I am making a conscious effort to choose pro uh, projects that are not only interesting process-wise, but that I will love the end product of as well. 
So yeah, so thank you so much for, for answering those questions. I'm trying to think if there's anything else we can tease out of this, but I think we've, I think we've discussed it all. Okay, so new question, talking about knitting styles. I would love to know, are you a continental knitter or an English knitter? And if you are, like, are you a thrower or a flicker? Um, I know I found it so fascinating. <laughs> A few years ago when I discovered that there are alternate ways to knit, I had no clue. I had no idea. So I was taught as an English thrower. That's how I knit. I'm still an English thrower. And I just thought that's how everyone knit. I had no idea. So it was so fascinating to me when I started learning that there's different ways of holding the yarns. You can hold it in your left. You can hold it in your right. You can hold um, when you're doing color work. You can hold two strands, a strand in each. You can hold a, two strands on your left, two strands on your right so many different options and i think it's so interesting um so yeah if you'd like to share below are you an english continental flicker thrower let me know what your knitting style is um, i've mentioned i'm an english thrower um, for color work i am still an english thrower <laughs> i just pick up one color and drop it and then pick up the next color and drop it and um, there was a time where i was questioning whether or not that was appropriate appropriate to be doing and um, when I watched a tutorial by Marie Wallen on how she does her color work I discovered she does things the exact same way and that reassured me that there's nothing absolutely nothing wrong with the way that I knit I don't think honestly I don't think there's anything wrong with the way anyone knits if you're as long as you're creating what you want to create in the end who cares how you hold the yarn? It should not matter. No method is better or worse than the other. I do understand there might be quicker methods. Some are slower. I'm sure mine's slow. I don't care. Honestly, I don't care. I'm not in it for the speed. I'm in it for the enjoyment that I get out of knitting. So yeah, please leave a comment down below and let me know. And um, so moving on to life stuff. Mm, two weekends ago, my daughter Lily and I went to visit my mom and my stepdad at Birch Lake, which was so lovely. The weather was not the greatest. It was extremely windy and actually quite cold, but uh, we still had managed to have a great time. Um, Lily went swimming. The water was freezing. I didn't go. I honestly did not even attempt to go in. So, um, yeah, what else? What else? We have no plans. It's a long weekend. We're not celebrating Canada Day. Um, we no longer celebrate. Uh, and if you're Canadian, I, I urge you to read up on this matter. And uh, there's lots of Lots of information out there to be found about why um, why you might consider not not celebrating Canada Day and instead maybe investing and in spending money um, to help residential school survivors, perhaps. Yeah. So that's that. Um, what else? We are enjoying some hot weather. Finally, it's been feeling like fall lately. Very cool temperatures. Um, it's actually been nice for sleeping. It hasn't been too hot and humid, so that's been nice. Um, oh, we have some monarch caterpillars. They're getting pretty chunky. I'll post, I'll post a few pictures. Sorry if you're squeamish about caterpillars, but just remember they turn into beautiful monarch butterflies afterwards. <laughs> and I think they're actually kind of cute with their little antennas and they're black and white yellow stripes um so yeah they they seem to be doing well this year i'm really we don't have a ton of them i think i've counted seven at the most uh, a few of them may have disappeared for very bright caterpillar caterpillars they see and i know exactly where they are they're on the milkweed and for some reason sometimes they're just like so impossible to find it's funny it's like hide and seek every day um but yeah they're they're doing very well this year last year i didn't see any reach this size so so I'm very hopeful that we're gonna have some, uh, some monarch butterflies come out of this. We saw a family of raccoons a few weeks ago. I posted that video on <laughs> Instagram. I only caught the kind of tail end of them running across the street to our neighbors. It was pretty cute though. Mama with five, 
I think she had five babies. She got her hands full. Uh, what else have we seen around here? Um, not much. Squirrels, chipmunks, the usual. Yeah. Some blue jays. They're all taking advantage of my bird bath that I have out front. That bird bath has like, I can't even count the number of joyous hours that that bird bath has brought me. It was a present from John on Mother's Day like several years ago now. And it's amazing. Like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know if they'd actually use it, um, but they do surprisingly, especially when you fill it up on hot days. Oh, it's so cute watching them take little baths and splashing around or drinking from it. It's awesome, but you gotta keep it clean. It's the one thing. Um, okay, yeah, I think, honestly, I think that is it. So I'm gonna leave things there. I just wanna say thank you so much for watching, especially if you stayed to the end. And if you did enjoy this video, please do give it a like and a subscribe just so you can see any of my new upcoming videos. And um, I'm wishing you all a very enjoyable next three weeks and filled with nice weather and happy making. <laughs> Bye.